So this person has also presented for us in the past and is a great friend, a great friend and a part of the Honors College of Dr. Barbara Alice Mann is one of our crew friends. And we know when we ask her, she will say yes. And she always brings us the most delightful, just the most delightful programs. We are so blessed to have Dr. Alice Mann with us and we're honoring her today. She's our Dr. Linda Smith lecturer. So let's all do a rah, 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 rah. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> didn't do that much. My throat is just kind of on the edge. It's all I can do to keep myself from doing chairs, but I don't dare today or I won't have any voice. So we will have to do some other things. So whenever you are ready, Barbara, you can take over. You can share the screen. She always does the greatest <laughs> PowerPoints. Unless today she decided not to. Nope, I did. It'll come <laughs> up. Yeah, they're always great. Okay, come on. It won't go to full. Oh, let's try that again. There we go. Okay, well, <clears throat> you're not a load on the voice in here. Well, it. So I'm talking about the uh, sacred twinship and the wild, wild mistakes that the uh, Christian missionaries made about indigenous philosophy of uh, collaboration, complementarity, twinship is the word that we use. It's cosmic twinship, it's sacred. The missionaries, of course, presented it as Satanism. And I wasn't originally going to say anything until Warren brought up the matter, but one of the reasons they thought that um, our cosmic twinship was evil and satanic was because we were matriarchies, still are matriarchies. So the, uh, well, by and large, most of the nations of uh, indigenous North America, and also if you look at it, a lot of Central and South American nations are matriarchal. And that doesn't mean uh, a flip over a patriarchy where women lord it over men. It means that women take the lead on most things and have a slight edge over men in uh, various issues. So it was not the Satanism that the missionaries imagined and for which they burned the entire Aztec library, for heaven's sakes, a real crime against humanity. And I want to go into what they thought and what was actually going on. So here I pulled up this uh, Smith uh, Field Decretal, so that means the decrees the Pope put up, and it's got in it an image of the angels throwing the devil out of heaven. And the devil you'll see, not only is he in stocks there on his feet, but he's got clawed hands and feet, he's got horns, he's got terrible ugly bat wings, he's just ugly as all get out. He's got pointy elf ears and all that. And of course the angels are in their little white clothes and they're gonna cast him up. That was the uh, medieval Christian concept of good versus evil because it's a Manichaean doctrine. There uh, cannot be two of things because two of anything indicates that one of them's gotta be evil, one of them's an imposter. So this, look at the date, 1425 is kind of, uh, I believe that was Gregory's reign, but that was not too much before uh, the Colombian attack started on indigenous America. So what happened when Europeans got out of Europe? You know, they were landlocked for a really long time. And yeah, they ran over to the Middle East during the Crusades and beat up on Muslims. But Muslims were also monotheistic and patriarchal and hierarchical. So it was not such a total shock. It was a war of which of the kids of this God was going to prevail. I'm the favorite. No, I am. 
when they got out and about and were sailing around in Africa and they saw the great kingdoms and, and Africa, and they were queendoms, by the way, of Central West Africa, and then they saw India and China, and they saw uh, indigenous America, which they hadn't even known was there because it's not in their Bible. They were undergoing a tremendous era of culture shock. And that was, I contend, one of the reasons that the so-called scientific revolution began, the renaissance to the Enlightenment, because they had to fit in all these new things into their philosophy. And consequently, Christianity started losing its power. So they get to the Americas and they got all their little uh, baggage going on there. I got their little Euro baggage down there in the bottom left. So Europeans get there, their hair's on fire because they are in such shock at what they're seeing. And one of the major things they saw were entire continental systems of millions of people, millions, who had never ever heard of their God or Jesus or any of the dogma. This was uh, literally unthinkable to the Europeans, so they did not think about it. They tried to fit or force Native Americans into their little schema, and the only way they could do that was by casting us as their little devil. And here you've got another uh, version of it from the uh, Malaya Smalafakaram, which means witches hammer. It was like a how-to manual on how to spot and, and drive out witches. So they just took their uh, demonology and plopped it right down on the Americas and defined all indigenous American beliefs, habits, and approaches as demonic. And their uh, approach at that point was to root out the philosophies and uh, force uh, Native Americans into a system that looked like Europe. That was how they dealt with their culture shock rather than incorporate new information into their minds. All right, so I've got a, I pulled up a little uh, squib here from John Smith, 1607, so we're uh, a little bit later. But I want you to notice, he's writing about the uh, Powhatans and the Algonquin peoples that lived in the Virginia area where he invaded. And he's got his little discussion on their religion. And he says, but their chief god they worship is the devil. This is after, oh, they adore and uh, give divine worship to the fire, the water, lightning, thunder. He has no idea what he's talking about here. And yes, fire was respected and is honored. It's not worshiped. Water is respected. It's honored. It's not worshiped. They were aspects of the twin cosmos that worked in collaboration to make life possible. In indigenous America, the idea is to balance the two primary forces of blood, which is earth, and breath, which is sky. Blood means lineage, by the way. It doesn't mean killing. So he uh, immediately describes indigenous thought as worship of the devil. He just assumed the devil existed, and he just assumed that it was animating indigenous America. All right, now I turn to uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, who came up with uh, the really important idea of metaphors as guiding thought, not just articulating thought, but actually guiding thought. They um, uh, are linguists, and they noticed and promoted, and, and they were clearly pretty accurate, that um, thought is metaphoric and is guided by a lot of unconscious connections that are connected metaphorically to one another. So if you've got a system of thought in which there's God or the devil and everything is a mannequin either, or men are good, women are bad, up is good, down is bad, then you are going to apply those concepts to everything that you happen to see or every new thing you encounter. Um, and so this is about all that baggage that the Europeans brought over to these shores. In the metaphoric imagination, they uh, just wrapped everything in their cultural uh, goodie bag 
and they wiped it on everything they were seeing. So if they thought, saw Native American women uh, or men as well using the color red and uh, putting it on their faces or their arms, they assumed that it was about blood and war. Well, it was about menstrual blood and successful childbirth. That was about your lineage and your clan connection. Um, they did not understand what they were looking at when they looked at things like sweat lodges. That's actually a womb. And the men go in there because the men don't have a womb, so they got to do the substitute. Men would actually cut themselves in during the sweat so that they could bleed without dying the same way women did. That was women's great power. They could bleed without dying, and they made new human beings out of their own body. That's quite a superpower. Uh, men felt really bad they didn't have it. So they uh, compensated with the uh, sweat lodge. They also compensated with the drum. The women actually gave men the drum because men were very, very sad that they could not make a second heartbeat blow their own heart the way women could. So the women got together and said, okay, we love these little buggers. And we don't want to be sad. How can we fix this for them? And they came up with a drum so that the men could now sit there on the drum and make a second heartbeat dum, 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 blow their own heart. And that's why that's always the uh, rhythm Native Americans traditionally use because it's a heartbeat and they call their drum the little boy. So that's Native American tradition, but Europeans would hear that drum and when they used drums, it was for war. So they just slap their little baggage right on top of it and assume that's what it is. Okay, so whose cultural metaphors are going to rule when two wildly divergent cultures come together? Whose cultural metaphors are going to rule? And the general standard answer is the metaphor with the army. Whichever the one has an army and is willing to use it is going to be ruling. And that's uh, often jokingly called the golden rule. The ones with the gold rule, the gold to pay the sol soldiers. And I found this Wizard of Id cartoon that's actually got that in there. Remember the golden rule, what's that? Whoever has the gold rules. Okay, so what was going on in actuality is that there were two entirely competing metaphors about the cosmos. A one thinking Europeans have a one thinking proposition. It's very linear. One thinking is what I call it. That's my name for it. So you've got one God, you've got one soul, you've got one life, you've got things like one true love. Anytime you see a movie, a European movie about twins, guaranteed that one of them's going to be evil, one of them's going to be good. And the good one will win in the end because wherever there's two, only one can survive, only one can rule. And I found that cartoon, there can be only one now kiss, and they're obviously enemies. It's a rivalry. And that's how uh, Manichaeism sees power. There can be only one. It's hierarchical. Now you get to two thinking, um, complementary matriarchal America. And what you have is the twin cosmos of Breath, which is a um, male proposition, that's outer space, by the way. It's not sky, sky is part of Earth. It's outer space, stars, constellations, sun, moon. Um, and then you've got Earth, which is water and even includes the mountains, although they tend to be breath oriented. Um, includes all the rivers and the lakes, which are very blood female oriented. They're amniotic fluid, is what they are, or what they're seen as. So two is the complete number. One is a fraction. Two is the complete number. And it's not accidental that Native Americans used a form of binary math, which is based on the concept of two, not one. So I found this cute little cartoon of a robot saying there are 10 types of people, those who understand binary and those who don't. Well, if you know binary, you know it's written as one zero. <laughs> Two is one zero. I thought that was pretty funny. And it shows you if you don't understand what somebody's talking about, you're going to completely misconstrue what the person's saying. 
So you've got convergent metaphors going on at your spiritual base. You've got that Christian one thinking, or you've got that good God or bad Satan. Nothing in between. And they must be deadly enemies, right? And furthermore, this is straight out of Lake Off and Johnson. Up is the good direction, down is the bad direction. So up is heaven, down is hell. That's part of a mythology that was going on there. And you can see in these pictures I pulled up the idea of heaven as up and you're going to it, a journey to it, or down as hell and it's clearly a place you don't want to be, right? So that's, that's Christian one thinking. The indigenous twinship is something else. The two are seen as compliments, they're best friends. Uh, Native men and women did not hate each other. They collaborate, cooperated together, a totally different take on the relations of, of the sexes. And by the way, we had many more than two sexes. Both are good. Both are required. And the whole point is this teeter-totter of balance up and down and you share the balance and it takes two of you. Ever tried to do a tear tire when you're a little kid all by yourself? You just keep hitting the ground and it hurt, right? Um, same as on the slide, you're up before you can go down, then you're down and you go up and then you go down. It's that kind of a proposition. You just, I'm sure when you're a kid, you did like I did, you run around in a circle, climb up, go down again, right? Everybody did that. And it was a cooperative kind of a relationship. So you've got these two wildly different metaphors at your spiritual base. It's interesting. The indigenous two thinking was immediately seen as devil worship. If you recognize both spheres and you thought both of them were good, that meant you were worshiping the devil. And I found this old uh, Jesuit picture missionaries there converting the Indians and of course they'd always present the Indians as kneeling and bowing because that's what they wanted to see. Um, and so notice that in this picture every single indigenous person is lower than the priest. His head is even higher than the highest feather on the man that's standing. And of course the cross is higher than all of them. Very Christian kind of mythology. Right? And notice also that there are only men in this drawing. There are no women in that drawing. That would not have happened, would never have happened. One of the things that happened is every time indigenous people went to a meeting or a treaty, the women came along with the men. There were as many men, women there as men. And uh, at one point, 1749, they were going to a meeting with the governor of, I think it was one of the Carolinas, and so they went and they, they just, the Indians were there and they just kept waiting and waiting and waiting, sitting around, eating up all the good food that the British governor was supplying. Finally, the governor got mad and he said, we're here, why don't we start the meeting? And the Cherokee chief looked at him and said, but where are your women? We can't start the meeting without your women. Very different mindsets. Okay, here's uh, from Paul Fisher, who was one of the most important of the, the um, Jesuit missionaries up around the Great Lakes. He, uh, jugglers, uh, juggler is what they call the uh, shamans, uh, medicine men uh, and women. Medicine men is kind of a, a European phrase too. Basically, we call them holy people and they're male or female and men deal properly with fire, breath, that sort of thing. Women deal properly with herbs, water-based medicines, and that kind of thing. So here you've got on the left a Cheyenne Spirit Lodge. And uh, Spirit Lodges don't necessarily have walls. They have no walls, actually, because um, spirits come and go at will, and you don't need walls if you can go through walls anyway. So what's the point? Um, and he's creating what amounts to a uh, a sweat lodge, but it's a, a spirit lodge. The spirits would come and sweat with them. Okay, so the devils 
oh man, they're just killing people and are inclined to think that they really are demons among them. And they really are people in communication with the devils. This is 1637, 30 years after John Smith wrote. He's still promoting this. And he was very intense about that. All right, the complimentary halves of blood and breath. That was Smith's Uki. He goes, oh, it's Uki. They call the devil Uki. No, 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 no. What they were considering devil would have been all gone, which is the water, the uh, blood power of earth. Uki, actually, in the way the missionaries parsed it up, was the breath half, the sky half, what they would have considered their God. <laughs> So I find that amusing. But the odd coin is the other half. Everything has halves. Everything is equally halved. So it's like looking at a fractal because it keeps spinning out uh, images of itself. Everywhere you look, images of itself. And they are going to mirror one another in some way. So you've heard of the great mountains, right? Of the... Uh, Ohio and Mississippi Valley, so it actually goes all the way across the northern plains. But um, you have a lot of these left, especially in Ohio. This comes from Steel Township, Pike County, Ohio. Um, the iconography of the mountains honors the blood breath concept. So you got the circle of sky as breath and the square of earth as the four directions is the blood. And you see that causeway in between, that's the name. That's you. You got a name. That's, that's you. That's where you fit into this. It's a little causeway connecting. Because your job in this life is to keep the two halves in balance. That's your job. And it's your prayer and ceremony and ritual is going to do that. There's also a very interesting circle of sky square of Earth here at the very bottom. If you look over there on the left, I've got a red circle around it. The circle of sky with the square of Earth inside it, so the Earth is surrounded by the sky. I thought that was kind of a neat expression. We've got other standard uh, depictions. One is the uh, circle of sky breath around the circle of Earth with a causeway for the name coming in. It's a space in between. Now, what that is, you're looking down, you've got a top-down view of the water and the sky around planet Earth and the back of turtle coming out of the water. Okay, if you've ever seen a turtle emerging from the water, first you see a round part of, of the back coming up. Not infrequently, there'll be moss or grass on the back of a sea turtle coming up. And so that's where the idea came from, the sky around and the back of turtle emerging from the water of Earth. It's a very neat idea, I think. Sometimes you see it in profile. So uh, the blood on the right side on the bottom, that's the back of the turtle emerging uh, in profile. And of course, the sky as well. And then you've still got the name in between. You see examples of this in the Blackwater Group in Ross County, Ohio. And you can clearly see the profile halves there. The one very obvious uh, circle in the middle on the third semicircle down, that's a burial mound because that's appropriate to Earth. The other one you see right below it in the middle, sort of, uh, and then one next to it facing the other direction. Those are the uh, circle with um, the earth in the middle. So, Christians, I notion of multiple spirits is not good. If you got multiple spirits, there's something really evil going on, right? And there are a lot of uh, depictions of Jesus casting out the uh, devils, the uh, multiple spirits in somebody. You see one from 1394 and another one. 1308 or so. In both of these, you've got Jesus casting out the devils that were infesting somebody. So it came as a real blow to Europeans to realize that you had multiple spirits. Everybody in indigenous America had multiple spirits. You have the spirit of blood that's earth based that came through your mother, and you have the spirit of breath 
which is sky based, and came through your father. This has got nothing to do with being gay or lesbian. I know there's a, a big rumor out there that two spirited people are LGBTQ. Well, LGBTQ certainly exists, but this isn't it. This is what everybody has. You got your spirit of breath, you got your spirit of blood. Um, everybody has that, and your job as a name is to keep them in balance because otherwise they can just be going in all directions at once. Now, Carl Sagan came out with Demon Haunted World. He talked about what happens when people believe in all these terrible spirits that are haunting reality. Um, and he said that's the danger of rejecting scientific thought, as certainly it is. And Rockenau was another one of the Jesuits in 1647. And uh, he brings up something else that really made the missionaries think that indigenous people were worshiping the devil. Oh, uh, they said, oh, they, you know, which is a French word, it means big eared loud. It's not an indigenous word. Uh, they, there's a kind of monstrous serpent, and everybody has their own different name for him. He lives in subterranean places under a rock, or he can climb up the mountains, but generally in lakes and rivers. That's quite true. It's a great horned serpent. Now, Christianity does not like serpents, you might have noticed. Uh, and I pulled up a couple of uh, versions of the the serpent, the devil came to Eve as a serpent. Oh, terrible things will happen. Christianity. Well, indigenous philosophy has a high regard for serpents. They are actually friends and especially useful to women. And I've wondered if some of the biblical stories about women and serpents was connected with the fact that women used to use serpents Oh, garter snakes in the, in the gardens and such, because they'll eat the field mice. They will, they will actually catch the vermin for you. So you don't have to run around trying to catch mice yourself. Um, so this, the so-called serpents are actually welcome. My grandmother would pick up a little serpent you know, and have snake talk with it, you know, just stick out her tongue and it stick out his tongue and they talk a little bit and then it go away. Um, so they were very useful in the fields. They did mousing because we didn't have kitty cats till the Europeans arrived. And it said that the Europeans only brought two good things, their music and their cats. Heard that said. But anyway, we have a high regard for serpents because they're boundary crossers. Um, and this, by the way, is what uh, LGBTQ is, boundary crossing. Totally different phenomenon. Look at the serpent. He can live in trees. She can live in the water. She can live on the land. She can live underground. She can go into caves. Wow, what kind of a creature can live in four different environments? We can't live in all those environments successfully. A serpent must know something. A serpent must know more than the rest of us. We probably better listen to her. Right? And that's the. Um, way that um, being something other than cisgender is regarded in indigenous America traditionally. I mean, a lot of people's heads have since been messed with, but traditionally, anybody who was naturally gay, lesbian, was regarded as a boundary crosser, crossing what looks like a natural boundary, but it's not for them. So therefore, they must know more than the rest of us. They must be in contact with some pretty powerful medicine. That's why they were almost always made into uh, shamans. So the serpent for us is a shamanic animal. So it's not surprising that we see the serpent all over. We know what the geography looked like. So this Chippy River for us actually starts with the Allegheny River, flows through the Ohio River, and down the lower Mississippi, out to the Delta. And as far as we're concerned, that is the Great Horned Serpent. He's traveling, he's going south. And uh, the, the Delta area there, that's, that's his horns. Serpents um, have to carry their medicine bundles somehow. 
if you're a snake, it's a whole problem. How do you carry your medicine bundle? Well, the great horned serpent extrudes his horns when he travels and slings the medicine bag in between them. So that's what's going on in the uh, Delta. I'll show you a little more about that. All right, you can see a picture on the far left of the Mississippi Delta. That's construed as his horns. And this bundle is that little sandbar right there in the middle. That's his bundle, his medicine bundle. So he's traveling south to the Delta. And the medicine bundle, you can see it in the um, uh, serpent mound that's in Adams County, Southern Ohio. That's not an egg. That's not his mouth. Those are his horns. And that's his medicine bag in between. And he's got his old and sooty stone there. That's a, a divining stone. Furthermore, because breath and blood have to mirror one another, the Milky Way is seen as the great horned serpent traveling. And uh, today with all the light pollution, a lot of people don't see the uh, Milky Way very clearly, but certainly people knew what it looked like before. And you can see the great horned serpent. And right at its end point, you can see what look like horns there on the bottom right. And you can see what looks like his medicine bundle there. So you've got one on earth, one in the sky. They balance. Same with Cygnus. And this has been enhanced so that you can easily see the stars that are connected with Cygnus. But you can see them with the naked eye too. The women, uh, the Hohokam canals, the Pima women made these canals. The river already existed and they noticed it looked an awful lot like Cygnus. So what they did is they completed the wings. Those are the canals, the wings are the canals, and if you'll notice, it coincides with the uh, feathers in the sky. One in the earth, one in the sky, it balances. So you got the breath and the blood, and they balance one another out. And that's the whole point. The earth, Mother Earth balances everything out, and works with Brother Sky to bring that about. So what's the danger of all this cultural tunnel vision that you see from the missionaries is that you miss the big picture. You shut yourself off from knowing what anybody else is doing. You hide in your own little bubble and you only listen to each other, reinforcing one another's messages. And the result is like Pinocchio, you can't see past your own nose. And you judge everything based on a very nearsighted view of reality. And the result is what you see on the left there. Great extreme violence being done to indigenous people by missionaries who thought that they were, or in this instance, a grandee, assuming that he has the right to do this to an indigenous person, pulling out his teeth, just yanking out his teeth. Um, it was disastrous for indigenous America. I don't have time to go all, into all of it, but the United States was part and parcel of that. Christianizing out of the Indians using Indian agents. We're almost all drunkards, by the way, uh, from 1819 to 1882. 1882 actually outlawing indigenous spirituality, and it was against the law till 1978. It was against the law for my family to tell me traditions, even though they did. Till 1978, uh, officials would punish people who were practicing their own religion to whatever group in America did that happen. Pretty nasty to anybody that wasn't Christian, but you didn't actually punish, or as they did with the um, Lakota and a few Cheyenne in 1790, shoot them down. I mean, 1890, wrong date. 1890, a wounded knee killed over 300 men, women, and children simply because they'd come to do the ghost dance. Just smoked them down with Gatling guns and forced the practice of Christianity on people. That's what happens when you have tunnel vision. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing here. All right. And I got done in time, Paula. <laughs> here, here. Can't hear you.
I am so sorry that your throat is bothering you. <sighs> Yours sounds worse than this mine. Been going on. I I bought some chlorosol chlorosec to something spray at, for throat that my dad showed me when when I was in college. And it doesn't have very many ingredients, but it calms the pain for an hour or so. I don't think it does anything medicinally. It's yeah. not any kind of cure, but it just calms it and you get some more voice. But geez, I'm sorry that you, that you have such a bad throat. And well, you know, it's been what? ongoing all semester. It just you know, I have to talk in class so it doesn't <laughs> Well, we really appreciate you being here. We're very thankful that you came to share with us. I, I was really impressed with your presentation. That was wonderful. And again, well, I'm so having it made day. sense to people. Yeah, so we are going to need a word. And I think get my chart here. I have to write it down because later I won't remember it. We know that. So I'm going to say snake is mm -hmm. the word yes. for the students to get credit this time. Snake. That should be a good word, I think. Yeah, I've always thought snakes were quite good citizens because they, they eat flies and mosquitoes and all all kinds of things that are mice, things that we don't want in our house. So anyway, do we have any questions for, for Barbara or any comments? I think your presentation is really timely with what we're going through with the polarizing in our country right now and the wanting to just see things in one direction. And I'm not saying it's just one group of people either, sadly. You know, we need to be able to avoid that tunnel vision. I just loved your line about the Europeans, the only good things they brought were music and cats. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Well, that's what I was told by the old folks when I was a kid. <laughs> that's really fun. That's a really funny observation. A sad one, too, but I really enjoyed that comment. So, Symmetra and Sadia, do we have any any comments on YouTube or Facebook? None on YouTube, Paula. Okay. How about... I have... A so, uh, Heidi said that, what a great talk, Barbara. Are you writing this particular theme up? Well, I do have some um, writing. I've got a book that came out of Oxford um, University Press called Spirits of Blood, Spirits of Breath. And it goes into these kinds of ideas. Yes, so well. that's available. Barbara's a very accomplished scholar. She's published a lot. She's internationally known for her work. A and which nation are you affiliated with? Seneca. Here, Seneca. Seneca. Okay, so this is the BAM Books Week vigil, and we are celebrating the Read Bam Books Day, which was proclaimed by our mayor, the mayor of Toledo. And our proclamation is on our page as you come into the events. But we're very fortunate to have Barbara with us, I think. The kinds of things she's talking about, the different ways we use the same words, the different stories we tell and our problem with not being able to understand someone else. These are all, these problems never go out of vote, unfortunately. And I think they all relate 
to our celebration of intellectual freedom too, because perhaps if people could read and do read, they will encounter people from different traditions, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, and maybe begin to understand some things they did not know before. And maybe we could then find a closer link to one another, find some things we have in common as the human family, rather than the separations. And I appreciated your comment about the LGBTQ plus community too, Barbara. I thought that was really interesting. And so, my lovelies, I am just delighted that you're here. The Zoom room, we seldom have even seven, so I'm thrilled. <laughs> I'm thrilled that we do. And I, I, however many we have on Facebook and YouTube, welcome to all of you and thank you for making us part of your day. This is a very important day because it's the time when we can celebrate our right to read and think freely. We can celebrate the joy that books bring to our lives and, and all other forms of creativity too, television, radio, magazines, every kind of form of expression is involved in our celebration because they all matter. They're all part of the way that human beings express their feelings and communicate with one another. And so, Sumitra, Sadia, are you there? There's a, a yes, lot. yes, Maud. Yeah, yeah. woohoo! I think we should share some loot. What do you think? You want to share some loot? Do you have? Shall we talk some more about Barbara's presentation? That might be good too. Because I just was really impressed, as always, I am. So. Does anybody else want to say anything about Barbara's presentation? Yes, Barbara, um, I enjoyed your presentation. I always do every year anyway, because you always bring something new uh, to share. And this year I can see the resemblance between some of the practices and beliefs um, of indigenous uh, folks in North America with some ethnic groups or tribes. I'm not ashamed of saying tribes in Nigeria. Uh, we, uh, tribe is not a negative thing for us. And so um, there are some of those um, animals, the snakes uh, that traditionally we reified and worshiped. Well, quote unquote, yes, our forefathers, foremothers did worship, but with the advent of the missionaries, all those things went into the background. However, there are still some folks who still hold on, some traditionalists, uh, to some of those um, ideas and practices. And even for those of us who would claim we are maybe Christians or whatever, many of us still mix and match. We try to take what is positive, quote unquote, from our traditional religion, worldviews, and combined with what might be considered to be Western, okay? Uh, part of the Western idea anyway is because um, like Nigeria is a former British colony. And so we have the uh, impact of missionaries and things like that. Um, so Barbara, my question to you, maybe I don't know whether it's really a question is, how can we um, continue to help particularly the young ones, the next generation, to be able to do some crit critical analysis and actually appreciate both the old and the new, knowing that both are important and have relevance to our lived experiences, 
rather than throwing the baby with the bath water out with things that were traditional in court. Well, that's a problem that everybody's struggling with. Some of the people think, well, recovery of language, but you know, like 15 or years or so ago, there were only 25 birth speakers of Seneca. And I forgot what I knew because I was taken away from it when I was four years old. I've forgotten all I knew as a four year old's understanding anyway. And um, you just, it's very hard to recover. So, but a lot of people are pushing get the old language back, use the language. Problem with that is nobody knows what the heck you're talking about. Um, it is a solution, but it's a self-isolating kind of a solution. Besides my experience, the kids are going to talk what they hear around them. They're not going to uh, make the effort. Very few of them will make the effort to learn anything else. And they will be embarrassed, a lot of them, to speak something that other people aren't, aren't speaking. Uh -huh. um, they have to be intellectually curious enough and reach a certain age where they want to know about it and they have the intellectual perspective to put into seeing about it. So I think they have to be a lot more mature than little kids. The ideal way is immersive from the time somebody is little because then you just understand it in your bones. But it's very hard to do when people are scattered as people are. Or they're confined on some tiny little, um, you know, death camp called reservation where there's not enough of anything. Um, the, as long as you're internally occupied, that's very hard to do. And certainly Native America is internally occupied. There are, uh, the southern third of Nigeria has got an awful lot of traditional folks. I think they're lucky enough to be in their own groups and areas and, and retain uh, relations and, and have a lot of the decentralized uh, uh, matriarchally led kinds of markets and that sort of thing. That's, that's a real boon, I think, if you're Nigerian. If you're Indigenous American, people in Central and South America may actually have a better shot than people in east of the Mississippi, west of the Mississippi, you've got a few groups that are better able to regroup. But if you get in the large areas that um, don't have reservations like Ohio, it's a, it's a lot harder, a lot harder, especially since, uh, like, uh, certainly when I was growing up, it was actually dangerous to your health to say who you were. It was dangerous. And so basically you were hiding out. Um, that does not encourage people to latch on to old systems. So it's, it's a problem everywhere. I don't pretend to have the answers, but what the elders told me my job was, was to set the record straight. Yes. So I've been trying to do that. It's in writing if anybody wants to consult it and see. What I've put together. And I'm not the only one doing these things, by the way. You've got a lot of people who are doing the same thing. So the record is there if people want to consult it. I think that there is going to be great environmental upheaval. Hmm. And traditional knowledge of how to live is going to get a lot more important than it is right now. Probably I won't be around to see it, but I think that that's likely to be a turning point in this sort of thing. And I'm afraid a lot of people, a lot of species are going to die in what's about to happen. That's anyway what the old prophecies said. They said, after the Europeans have gotten this turtle that carries us all on her back, they will be such irritants. So irritating. And I think that was a reference to pollution that she's going to start rocking her carapace. That means the Atlantic coast and the California coast rocking. And then she's going to do a 360 in the water and brush the irritants off her back. As she did once before, say, is the tradition. <laughs> um, and then slowly the people will come back. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but there were some 
markers of when that was going to be happening. For example, Scania Dayo, the Seneca prophet, said, um, the year 2010 is when it's going to start. My goodness. And uh, another prophecy said that the ocean will turn black. Well, in 2010, you had the BP oil spill, right? And another tradition said when the trees start dying from the tops down. I just went to a conference in Boston over the summer, and I noticed driving through a lot of the areas, trees were dying from the tops down. So there's a lot of things like that that suggest they were talking about extreme pollution, but they just didn't have the words because they didn't have the technological knowledge to explain what they were seeing. So I think that maybe that will occur. Thank you for all you are doing. <laughs> Thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you so much.